Uncomfortable knowledge in central banking. Economic expertise confronts the visibility dilemma. Jacqueline Best. Abstract. How do central bankers cope with the uncomfortable fact that there are significant limits to their expertise without losing authority? Drawing on Steve Rayner's concept of uncomfortable knowledge, this paper undertakes a historical examination of the early years of Paul Volcker's role at the head of the Federal Reserve, and then traces the ways in which the uncomfortable fact of ignorance has been dealt with in the years since then. From the reflexive and experimental approach of the 1980s, through the dismissal and displacement of the Great Moderation, to the exceptionalism and new experimentalism of the post-2008 era. In each of these eras, I argue that central banks face a visibility dilemma. Their expertise must be visible enough to demonstrate their mastery but not so conspicuous that the often ad hoc and uncertain nature of their craft generates political pushback about their role and authority. Introduction. Obviously, we can study the matter. I see no prospect that any amount of study is going to tell us what the behavior of M1 is going to be in the short run. It is unknowable, in my opinion, to all the best brains in the world. Paul Volcker, U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman, 5 October 1982. 1. As economists and policymakers we know that uncertainty is everywhere and that it has worsened in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. Our tools can only manage some of this. That is the nature of our craft yet our constituents usually do not think that way. They demand decimal points in our forecasts, and they demand that we explain why our decimal points differ from someone else's decimal points. Stephen Pillow, Governor of the Bank of Canada, 2014, Central bankers are often seen as possessing almost superhuman levels of expert knowledge. Portrayed as geeky superheroes saving the day in the aftermath of the 2008 global financial crisis, and more recently scorned as archvillains for using their expertise for the few rather than for the many, Buttonwood, 2015, Freeland, 2013. Yet, of course, because their work and the world around them are extraordinarily complex and rife with uncertainty, central banks regularly confront limits to their knowledge. How do central bankers cope with this uncomfortable fact of policy ignorance, while at the same time retaining their authority and independence? To answer this question, I draw on Steve Rayner's 2012 concept of uncomfortable knowledge and consider how monetary policymakers manage their unknown knowns, the knowledge that institutions possesses but try hard to forget. 2. Because central banks' authority is linked to their expertise, the knowledge that is often most uncomfortable for them is the fact of their own ignorance in the face of an uncertain economy. Even when central bankers themselves are open to acknowledging what they don't know, they face external pressure to demonstrate their expertise. Markets are deeply uncomfortable with uncertainty, while politicians are apt to use central banks' errors as a sign that they need greater oversight or constraining rules. The two quotes above both speak to these difficulties. As I will elaborate below, although Volcker was blunt when speaking to his fellow Federal Open Market Committee, FOMC, members about their ignorance of the direction of the money supply and the failure of their monetarist experiment, he concealed the significance of that shift from political leaders and markets for fear of reprisals. 32 years later, while Pillow, 2014, was more open about the limits of central bank expertise, he was still struggling to deal with external actors who demanded accuracy down to the decimal point. Both central bankers faced political pushback to their efforts to manage the limits of monetary expertise. Over the past decades, Central banks' strategies for coping with the limits of their expertise have been at the heart of political debates over their role in authority. The most recent of these debates is about the breadth of central banks' mandates, as policymakers disagree about whether they should play a bigger role in supporting growth, reducing inequality and tackling climate change or instead, stick to their knitting, with a narrow interpretation of their price stability mandate. Bweeter, 2014. Fonten et al. 2016. Although this debate is fueled by central banks' massively increased role in the post-2008 global economy, this study suggests that it is the latest iteration in a much longer series of struggles over the authority of central banks, ranging from efforts to reign in their independence in the early 1980s, to suggestions of their growing irrelevance in the early 2000s, to today's concerns about their oversized scope and power. In each case, political struggles over central banks' role and authority have been fueled by concerns about their expertise and its limits. 
This paper takes a historical approach to the question of how central banks cope with uncomfortable knowledge, beginning by examining Volcker's early days at the Federal Reserve in the late 1970s and early 1980s, moving on to consider how techniques evolved during the great moderation of the 1990s and early 2000s and concluding with the present moment and its debates. In each era, I ask three questions. 1. How uncomfortable were actors both within and outside of central banks with the limits of monetary expertise? 2. What strategies did central bankers use to manage these limits? And 3. What implications did these responses have for debates about the authority and role of central banks? I argue that the strategies that central bankers have used to respond to the problem of policy ignorance have changed in important regards since the early 1980s, from a more reflexive and experimental approach through the dismissal and displacement of the great moderation, to the exceptionalism and new experimentalism of the post-2008 era. Moreover, in each of these eras, one strategy, obfuscation or the attempt to conceal the limits of their expertise and of the often ad hoc nature of their actions, has remained crucial, even as it evolved over time, from outright secrecy in the 1980s, to selective transparency in the 1990s and early 2000s, to the current attempt to build in more ambiguity and flexibility. Central banks rely on obfuscation because it enables them to manage a particular dilemma surrounding the visibility of their expertise. As Coombs and Thiemann, 2022, note in the introduction to this special issue, central banks play a liminal role, both straddling and constructing the boundary between politics and economics, and between the state and the economy. This boundary role produces a visibility dilemma for central banks. Their expertise must be exercised clearly enough to demonstrate their mastery and authority but not so conspicuously that the rougher edges of their craft, its uncertainties, errors and ad hoc experiments, raise questions about their capacity and neutrality, producing the kind of political pushback that we have witnessed over the years. Although both scholarly and popular accounts have often treated the early Volcker years as a turning point in central bank tactics for managing inflation and a precursor of the contemporary rule-based orthodoxy, Krippner, 2011, Walter and Wansleben, 2019, this study shows just how ad hoc and experimental that era was, and how aware Volcker was of the limits of expert knowledge. In that regard, the early 1980s are less a precursor to the Great Moderation and more a preview of some of the struggles that central banks are facing today. In revisiting and reconsidering some of the earlier days of modern central banking, this paper is part of a wider movement among political economists, sociologists and economic historians who have sought to complicate that history, including the important work of Greta Krippner, 2011, on the accidental origins of financialization as well as more recent work by Timo Walter and Leon Wansleben, Honor Osgood and Ben Clift among others, Clift, 2020, Krippner, 2011, Osgood, 2021, Walter and Wansleben, 2019. What this paper adds to this literature is a stronger emphasis on the limits of expertise and a sharper focus on the political pushback that central bankers have regularly faced in response to their attempts to address this dilemma. Thus, whereas Krippner, 2011, suggests that Volcker's attempt to avoid responsibility for high interest rates was successful, this paper instead suggests that this depoliticizing strategy failed, producing a more political fraught narrative of the history of central banking practice. In bringing a new perspective to the study of recent debates on central banking, I also seek to contribute to a growing literature on the politics of central banks' increasing reliance on unconventional monetary policy particularly those debates that examine the implications for central bankers' increasing reliance on market infrastructures. Braun, 2018. Braun et al. 2018. Walter and Wansleben, 2019. Their Expert Authority. Braun, 2015. 2018. And Their Reputation, Legitimacy and Accountability. Deitch et al. 2018. Moskella, 2021. Riles, 2018. Tucker, 2018. In doing so, I demonstrate how what often appear to be technical debates about central banks' mandates are not only political, as others have argued, but also imbricated in questions about how central banks manage uncomfortable knowledge about their own ignorance. Theoretically, this paper contributes to a growing literature on the strategic and practical use of ignorance in organizations. Gross, 2010.
Gross and Magai, 2015. Lumen, 1998. Magai, 2012. This scholarship appends the presumption that ignorance always poses a problem for expert organizations, pointing to the strategic value of being ignorant about certain awkward facts. What my work adds to these insights is an attention to the historicity of different institutional strategies for coping with ignorance and an emphasis on those moments where organization actors are more reflexive about their own ignorance, highlighting the constructive potential for what I call, practical ignorance, best, 2021. In this paper, I also examine the political dilemmas that the management of expertise and ignorance can pose for organizations like central banks whose authority is so closely linked to their expert status. Yet, whereas in past writings I have emphasized the broader political economic costs of neoliberal forms of monetary expertise and ignorance, best, 2018, 2020, 2021, here I am focusing more closely on the problems that uncomfortable knowledge poses for central banks themselves. The next section of this paper provides a more detailed elaboration of the concepts of ignorance and uncomfortable knowledge, as well as a discussion of their political implications. I then provide an outline of my analytic framework. The remainder of the paper charts the different responses that central bankers have had to the problem of uncomfortable knowledge since the early 1980s as well as the different strategies they have developed for managing it. Ignorance, uncomfortable knowledge and the dilemma of visibility. Rainer's 2012. Core insight in his paper, Uncomfortable Knowledge, is that organizations don't want to know everything that they possibly can. Instead they seek to develop, simplified, self-consistent versions of the world which exclude a great deal of information that might contradict that version, page 1. This excluded information is made up of, unknown knowns, knowledge that an institution has either forgotten or that it works hard to ignore. In the case of central banks, the most important form of uncomfortable knowledge is evidence of the limits of expert knowledge itself. Like all organizations, central banks must do their work in a world in which a great many things are unknowable. They must therefore contend with the problem of the necessary limits to their own knowledge, the problem of policy ignorance. Of course, as Magai, 2012, 2019, has demonstrated, the prevalence of ignorance need not necessarily be a problem. Ignorance is not only an intrinsic and necessary part of all knowledge creation but it can also be mobilized strategically by organizations seeking to avoid difficult decisions or to deflect responsibility. Yet for central banks, managing institutional ignorance is a particularly fraught task because their authority, and their claim to independence from direct government oversight, is closely linked to their claim to expert knowledge. The significance of central banks' claim to expert authority can be understood in both epistemological and pragmatic terms. Epistemologically, as Coombs and Thiemann, 2022, argue in their introduction to this special issue, central banks help to define and reproduce a boundary between the state and the economy in contemporary capitalist economies. With their historical roots in the private banking community and their important role in supporting the state's goals, particularly in times of war, Central banks have always occupied an ambiguous place that resists any tidy demarcations between politics and economics. As Timothy Mitchell, 1991, 1999, notes, this boundary is not a definite thing or line but rather a mutable effect of certain governance practices. He goes on to argue that this boundary effect, and the creation of a domain that we understand as, the economy, depends on particular forms of, economic, knowledge that treat the economy as something separate from the state, Mitchell, 1999, page 94. The expertise that central bankers rely on as they manage the monetary system thus plays an epistemological role within capitalism, creating a clear separation between the knower and the object of the knowledge, as well as the effect of a separate economy that they can manage through that knowledge. Yet, this is a boundary role that central bankers are not generally keen to emphasize. As Coombs and Thiemann, 2022, remind us in the introduction, liberal theorists of monetary policy have preferred to represent money as water rather than as the blood of the sovereign. In the process they have sought to naturalize the role of central bankers as expert technicians, largely obscuring the political nature of their actions. Central bankers may work to produce the effect of a separate, self-regulating economy through their actions, but they do not want to be too visible in that role. In addition to these epistemological stakes, 
central bankers also have pragmatic reasons for concealing evidence of their ignorance. As Markison, 2009, and Mudge and Voshe, 2019, have argued, central banks have increasingly relied on their claim to scientific knowledge, or scientization, to support their authority. While central bankers may not always be uncomfortable with the limits of their expertise themselves, they often face pressure from external actors who are. Market actors have a strong preference for clear central bank signals about the likely future direction of interest rates, since it reduces the uncertainty that they face in making their financial bets. Ehrman and Fratcher, 2005. Rolls and Peterson, 2021. Politicians tend to be sensitive to signs that central banks are unsure of their expertise, because it raises questions about the legitimacy of their relative independence. These external pressures create challenges for central banks, particularly at moments when they face considerable uncertainty about their existing economic assumptions and models. Hence, the visibility dilemma that central banks face in justifying their expert authority and autonomy. Their application of expertise must be visible enough that they are seen to play their part authoritatively, but not so visible that the often ad hoc and contestable nature of their actions shows through. As the historical cases discussed here demonstrate, if the potentially ad hoc nature of their actions becomes too visible, they run the risk of criticism, market panic and political pushback. If on the other hand, they play their part so invisibly that their role appears unnecessary, they run the risk of being treated as redundant. In the remainder of this paper, I will tease out the implications of uncomfortable knowledge for central bankers' actions and role. In each case, I will first consider the degree to which central bankers and external actors are in fact uncomfortable with the limits of monetary expertise. I will then consider how policymakers have sought to manage evidence of uncomfortable knowledge. Do they engage in dismissal, a response that Rayner, 2012, suggests involves rejecting uncomfortable knowledge as unreliable, not relevant, imprecise, not timely or on the wrong spatial scale, page 116. Or do they instead respond through displacement, a more complex response that substitutes a more manageable surrogate by, for example taking a model designed to inform management of a real-world phenomenon and turning it into the object of management, Rayner, 2012, page 120. As I suggest in the empirical sections of this paper, these two strategies often coexist, as central banks have become progressively scientized they have also increasingly sought to displace uncomfortable knowledge by governing their models rather than the messier empirical world. To these strategies that Rayner, 2012, identifies, I am adding three more, exceptionalism, obfuscation and strategic reflexivity. Another way for an organization to deal with uncomfortable knowledge is to recognize it as valid on an exceptional basis, by identifying a moment of extreme crisis like the 2008 financial crisis or the COVID pandemic, that temporarily introduces new unknowns. In such cases, the uncomfortable fact of ignorance can be simultaneously acknowledged and treated as a temporary problem. Obfuscation and strategic reflexivity are both rather different in their logic, involving more conscious efforts to conceal or display uncomfortable truths. I was struck during my research into the Volcker era by the lengths to which Federal Reserve officials would go to conceal the extent of their ignorance and its implications. Obfuscation can also take subtler forms than outright secrecy, including selective transparency and strategic ambiguity, as I outlined below, but it always works to make certain uncomfortable facts invisible. Strategic reflexivity, in contrast, is the only response to uncomfortable knowledge that involves publicly recognizing at least some of its truth and using that recognition to achieve certain institutional goals. As I have written elsewhere, Best, 2021. Although reflexivity is one of the less common institutional responses to evidence of ignorance, it is a potentially transformative one, as it points towards the possibility of finding ways of both acknowledging and living with the limits of expert knowledge. Finally, in each case, I will also consider how these policy strategies affected central banks' contested role. What political pushback, if any, did central banks face to their policy efforts in each historical moment? Did they find a solution to the dilemma of expert visibility, or did they find that the ad hoc nature of their actions became either too visible to avoid censure or so invisible that they began to seem irrelevant? The early 1980s, reflexivity, experimentation and secrecy.
The Federal Reserve under Volcker's leadership was not only a distinct creature from today's central banks but was also quite different from its precursors. Volcker was far more jealous of the Federal Reserve's independence from the government than his predecessors and more skeptical about the accuracy and usefulness of the data that his staff produced, Lindsay et al. 2004. These two traits helped to shape the response of the Federal Reserve when the shocks of the early 1980s brought new forms of uncomfortable knowledge to the fore. When Reagan came into office in January 1980, he made fighting inflation one of the top priorities of his government adopting monetarism as his administration's anti-inflation strategy and identifying the Federal Reserve as the primary weapon in that battle. Volcker, who had been appointed by Jimmy Carter, had already shifted the Fed's operating strategy to targeting the money supply in October 1979. Yet, he and the other members of the FOMC approached their task rather differently than the Reagan administration might have wished leading to conflicts that were fundamentally about different strategies for coping with the problem of uncomfortable knowledge. The introduction of the Fed's new monetary policy, combined with a range of deregulatory financial policies passed by Congress, resulted in an extremely unstable monetary situation. It turned out that the money supply was a lot harder to control than had been assumed. It also became clear that something odd was happening to the velocity of money, the number of times that a given unit of currency is used within a specific time frame, which policymakers relied on in order to calculate how rapidly to increase the money supply. As the U.S. economy slipped into a brief recession in 1980, and then a second, much more severe one in 1981, the shocks were destabilizing enough to unsettle many of the economic assumptions that actors in the administration and in the Fed had relied on, raising uncomfortable questions about their expertise. On the administration side, although Reagan's economic policymakers, including the Treasury Secretary, Donald Reagan and the Undersecretary for Monetary Affairs, Beryl Sprinkle, had started out confident of their ability to transform the economy, it didn't take long for them to realize that things weren't going according to plan. Best, 2020, 2021. At the Federal Reserve, although early reviews of their new techniques had been encouraging, over time it became clear that their efforts to control the money supply through M1 were running into difficulties. Although, as I will discuss below, Volcker himself was inclined to be quite reflexive about the fact that there were things that the Fed did not know, he and the FOMC had to cope with a reality in which both the Reagan administration and the financial markets were deeply uncomfortable with that possibility. These different degrees of discomfort about monetary ignorance played an important role in determining how key actors dealt with evidence of the uncertain terrain that the economy was entering. Policy responses to uncomfortable knowledge. Most of the members in Reagan's administration opted to dismiss the evidence of the limits of monetary expertise. Milton Friedman, who was not only a public intellectual at the time but also an advisor to Reagan and a member of the President's Economic Policy Advisory Board, PEPAB, was steadfast in his denial that any of the difficulties that were faced by the U.S. economy in the early 1980s pointed to the failure of monetarism. He was echoed in this dismissal by Undersecretary Sprinkle, his former student. When confronted with evidence that the velocity of money was changing dramatically, both Friedman and Sprinkle insisted that it was a temporary phenomenon and shouldn't be factored into efforts to manage the money supply. 3. In response to arguments that the unprecedented volatility of interest rates pointed towards the failure of monetarism, both insisted that the problem lay not with the theory but with those implementing it, in other words, the Federal Reserve. The FOMC, and Volcker in particular, took a rather different approach to the growing evidence that existing models and theories were no longer working as expected opting instead for a more reflexive response that acknowledged that current events posed challenges for their expertise. In a statement to the Joint Economic Committee in June 1982, Volcker argued that one of the core assumptions that underpinned the Fed's efforts to target monetary aggregates was that velocity was relatively stable over the longer term. 4. Yet, as he noted then and a few years later to the PEPAB, velocity is not very certain now. 5. One of the explanations for this uncertainty was the introduction of now accounts, which allowed banks to pay interest on checking accounts, changing the ways in which the public held and used money, a change that Volcker suggested was structural. Behind closed doors, Volcker was even more blunt about the limits of the Fed's understanding of the economy.
Even in the earliest days of the shift to monetarism, when the Fed was getting close to meeting its targets, Volcker noted that this success could easily be a coincidence. 6. By October 1982, with the country suffering through a recession, discussions at the FOMC were even more explicit about the limits of their attempts to measure and direct monetary policy. It was becoming increasingly clear to both FOMC members and Fed staff that M1, and its relationship with the wider economy, could not be readily controlled. In response to FOMC member Lawrence Rue's suggestion that the answer was further study, Volcker bluntly stated, I see no prospect that any amount of study is going to tell us what the behavior of M1 is going to be in the short run. It is unknowable, in my opinion, to all the best brains in the world. 7. This reflexive kind of monetary policy required a more experimental approach that sought to act without much certainty of the outcome. When the FOMC agreed in its October 1979 meeting to try monetarism, they were quite explicit, at least among themselves that this was a provisional approach that they would try for the next three to four months before assessing what they had learned. As Volcker noted at that meeting, he would support a move to a new approach, so long as we are not locked into it indefinitely. 8. Three months later, at their January meeting, members of the FOMC regularly referred to their new focus on targeting non-borrowed reserves as an experiment. 9. Volcker was also clear that the Fed had to use considerable discretion in implementing this new approach. This might seem counterintuitive, given that the main advocates of monetarism at the time were convinced that discretion could be minimized with the adoption of a clear monetary rule. Yet, as Volcker explained when he first proposed the monetarist experiment, the policy needed to be flexible. While there would be a clear change in emphasis if we decide upon this new approach, Inherent in it is that we simply are going to have to leave a lot of discretion in the actual operations to the desk, to my benevolent oversight, and to ex post review, by the committee. 10. Given the uncertainties that this new approach faced, how should the Fed communicate its strategy? This was a question that was given considerable attention to the FOMC. One of the reasons that Volcker adopted a monetarist strategy in 1979 was that he hoped it might shift market psychology by communicating the Fed's commitment to do what it took to get inflation down. Biven, 2002, page 241. Yet, in spite of this appearance of openness, the FOMC's communication strategy at this time was based on secrecy and obfuscation, as the Fed carefully concealed the limits of its expertise from both the markets and the Reagan administration. This opaque approach to communications was consistent with a long tradition of secrecy in central banking. Good friend, 1986. Greeter, 1987. Yet, it was also notable in this instance given that it contradicted monetarist theory, which relies on the communication of a clear policy rule to ensure credibility. As members of the FOMC noted in early discussions of the rollout of the policy, there was considerable confusion among market participants about what the Fed was doing. Although some FOMC members argued for greater openness, staff disagreed, noting that providing clear information about the Fed's anticipated path could actually intensify market uncertainty if they had to change direction suddenly. 11. Recognizing the limits of their own expertise, the Fed thus not only took a more provisional and experimental approach to policy but also deliberately obscured their chosen strategy for fear that markets would not understand it. There was, of course, a second reason for this opaque approach to communications. It made it more difficult for Reagan's economic policymakers and advisors to know what the Fed was doing. Volcker remained cryptic in discussing the Fed's policymaking process in his meeting with Treasury Secretary Reagan, Sprinkle and the members of the PEPAB. Even when he decided to give up on monetarism, in October 1982, the announcement was so vague that policymakers in the Treasury weren't sure whether something significant had changed or not. 12. The memos and minutes from the time make clear that this strategy of obfuscation infuriated them. 13. Political pushback. The difficulty of remaining invisible. Volcker and the FOMC had good reason for being cautious in dealing with the Reagan administration and Congress, both of which were putting huge pressure on the Fed to change course. By 1981, the federal funds rate was jumping as high as 20%, a political problem of immense proportions for anyone trying to get re-elected. Congress put forward a host of different strategies for reigning in the Fed, 
including a resolution asking the central bank to raise its monetary targets and proposed legislation requiring the Fed to target interest rates rather than the money supply. The Treasury Department was critical of these maneuvers, as is clear from the many memos and briefing notes that staff members circulated on these proposals. They were anxious to avoid loosening monetary policy too soon, which they believed would precipitate spiraling inflation. 14. And to prevent any return to a situation in which the government sought to fine tune the economy. 15. At the same time, Sprinkle himself, as undersecretary, had prepared a study of the Fed which recommended reducing its independence. The study argued that central bank independence had not created the kind of anti inflationary policies that were needed and went on to argue independence, or the lack thereof, is not an end in itself. Our goal is to set up the institution arrangement that is most likely to assure a lasting, prudent, non-inflationary monetary policy. 16. All of these political pressures sought not only to gain more authority over the Federal Reserve's activities but also to justify that control in the name of their belief that better expert management of monetary policy was possible, dismissing the uncomfortable idea that there were serious limits to monetary expertise. In his response to these criticisms, Volcker questioned the underlying assumption that less ad hoc approaches were likely to work. In response to those members of Congress who sought to impose stricter targets, for example, he suggested, monetary targets convey a sense of simplicity that may not always be justified in a complex economic and financial environment. There is far from universal appreciation of the fact that the economic significance of particular aggregates is constantly evolving in response to rapid changes in financial markets and practices. 17. It is easy, in retrospect, to underestimate just how much political pressure the Fed was under. Krippner, 2011, has pointed to Volcker's strategy as an early example of the Fed's successful effort to depoliticize their actions. Yet, a closer look at the FOMC's decision to give up on its monetarist experiment reveals just how fragile their position was. The Fed had gained some policy space through its strategies of obfuscation, both its lack of transparency about the provisional nature of its approach to targeting the money supply and its choice of indirect policy instruments. As Krippner has pointed out, by targeting reserves rather than directly trying to control interest rates, the FOMC gained some distance from the painfully high rates that their actions produced. And yet, as the multiplying congressional and executive attempts to control the Fed attest, these depoliticizing strategies only worked to a point. Even as the FOMC tried to reduce the visibility of its actions, ultimately it was not able to conceal the political consequences of its ad hoc approach. As Krippner, 2011, herself notes, there was a trade-off between responsibility and control in Volcker's strategy. By shifting its target to reserves and away from the federal funds rate, the FOMC may have reduced its political exposure, but it also gave up an important measure of control of the short-term outcome. Yet, where she suggests that this strategy was ultimately successful for Volcker's Fed, I would contend that the costs were simply too high politically and economically, threatening the very independence that these strategies were designed to protect. Even as Volcker vigorously defended the Fed's approach to Congress, FOMC minutes reveal how seriously he was taking the attacks. At the fateful meeting in October of 1982, in which Volcker convinced the members of the FOMC to stop targeting M1, effectively giving up on the monetarist experiment, he was explicit that he was doing so in order to gain more control over interest rates which had been climbing too high and worsening the recession. And he was also clear that the stakes that the Fed faced at this point were extremely high, not just for the economy, but for the independence of the institution itself. We are dealing with a real world and assessing where the risks are. It's quite clear in my mind where the risks are. I think I made it quite clear in terms of economic developments around the world. But if one wants to put it in terms of risk to the institution, if we get this one wrong, we are going to have legislation next year without a doubt. 18. Although the FOMC initially adopted a more reflexive and experimentalist set of policy strategies, combined with some careful obfuscation to give themselves some policy space, the economic volatility that their actions produced made the political consequences of their actions all too visible, hastening a political backlash and forcing them to change course. What has happened since then? As the discussion above makes clear, 
The path from the early 1980s to today is not linear, even though this history is often narrated as a straight line from the first experiments with monetarism to monetary policy today. If we are to understand how we got from there to here, we therefore need to survey the changes that occurred in the intervening decades. Tracing the ways in which the tensions that I uncovered above played out in the Great Moderation, the 2008 global financial crisis, and the years since then. The Great Displacement. Alan Greenspan, 2004, the Federal Reserve Chairman who oversaw the era that has been dubbed, the Great Moderation, once remarked that his generation of monetary policymakers had been shaped by the trauma of the 1970s and the enormous difficulties they had faced in reigning in inflation. That fear of repeating the experience of the 1970s ultimately underpinned the emergence and global spread of a culture of central banking that placed the narrow pursuit of low inflation at the core of its practices. The Great Moderation was an era in which discomfort with the possible limits of monetary expertise spread to central bankers themselves. One of the main reasons for wider discomfort was the emergence and transnational spread of a largely unquestioned consensus about the economic logic of monetary policy. Johnson, 2016, ch. 1. At the core of this new monetary consensus were several ideas that combined Friedman's conviction in the importance of expert monetary rules with a much stronger belief in central bank independence. If central banks were to keep inflation under control, they needed to commit to following a clear monetary rule. Since attempting to target the money supply had proven to be difficult, other targets were adopted instead, with inflation targeting ultimately becoming the dominant approach. For this strategy to work, central banks also had to transparently communicate their commitment to achieving the target whatever the costs. For that commitment to be credible, moreover, economists argued that the central bank must be sufficiently independent of the government, since politicians often fell into the trap of time inconsistency, by promising low inflation at one point in time but actually delivering inflationary policies to woo voters. 19. Policy responses to uncomfortable knowledge. This was not an era defined by much reflexivity about the problem of policy ignorance, but rather one in which policymakers adopted the strategies of dismissal and displacement. Advocates of this new approach to monetary policy often dealt with uncomfortable knowledge about their past ignorance by re-narrating the early 1980s so that the failures of monetarism were parenthetically noted while being interpreted as necessary steps towards the ultimate discovery of contemporary rule-based strategies, implying that there was nothing in those earlier difficulties that was relevant today. Best, 2020. Good Friend, 2007. The monetary policies of the Great Moderation also relied on a more concrete strategy for coping with uncomfortable knowledge about the problem of ignorance, displacement. Over time, certain banking models and techniques that were designed to provide information on the wider economy became themselves the object of governance, displacing the uncomfortable problem of the limits of knowledge by sidelining it. The rule-based approach to monetary policy rested on the natural rate assumption that any short-term Phillips curve trade-offs between unemployment and inflation didn't exist over the longer term, allowing policymakers to neatly ignore the employment and growth dimensions of their mandates in order to focus narrowly on price stability, often through an inflation target, Friedman, 2002. The Federal Reserve, which was explicitly tasked with paying attention to unemployment as well as inflation, displaced the uncomfortable complexities of this broader remit by effectively ignoring one half of its mandate, something that Congress tried to formalize through legislation. Even though the legislation was ultimately not adopted, mentioning the full employment mandate at the time was akin to sticking needles in the eyes of central bankers, according to Janet Yellen, 2012. The European Central Bank, ECB, which was designed at the peak of the Great Moderation, resolved this potential dilemma by formally defining the mandate of the bank narrowly around the support for price stability defined as a rate of inflation that should not exceed 2%. Narrowing monetary policy to price stability only displaced some of the potential sources of uncertainty and ignorance. There was still the difficult problem of obtaining reliable data to feed into policy decisions, a challenge that had been one of the sources of Volcker's skepticism about monetary expertise. While the exceptional macroeconomic stability of the Great Moderation reduced this problem somewhat, central banks also outsourced the problem of gathering and interpreting much of that information to market actors.
As Krippner, 2011, page 133, notes, the Fed under Greenspan became wedded to a strategy of letting the market lead in setting interest rates and validating them after the fact through formal policy decisions. A strategy that Braun, 2015, also identified at the ECB. At least in theory, this outsourcing strategy allowed central banks to displace part of the difficult task of forecasting the future direction of the economy by following the market signals instead of coming up with its own. These strategies of dismissing and displacing the uncomfortable problem of the limits of knowledge produced a set of policy practices that were distinct from those adopted by the Federal Reserve in the early 1980s. Although Volcker's FOMC was ostensibly following a rule in seeking to manage the money supply, in practice its more reflexive approach to the limits of expertise produced a more experimental and ad hoc monetary strategy. One of the core principles of central banks during the Great Moderation, in contrast, was that of credible commitment, which required declaring and sticking to a clear rule or target come what may. In so far as they could, central bankers sought to let the models do the work. For an example on how this aspiration played out in the case of the Bundesbank, see Ibrachevich, 2022. What about the strategy of obfuscation, which was so central to Volcker's strategy? It would appear to have been completely reversed by the new commitment to transparency that became the mantra in the 1990s and early 2000s. Yet, the actual practice of monetary policy during this era paints a rather more complex picture. Although central banks were committed to achieving a narrowly defined mandate focused on price stability, in practice, as Ben Clift, Clift, 2020, pp. 297-301, and Benjamin Friedman, 2002, have noted, they often sought to take concerns about employment and growth into account. If many central banks were engaging in what Clift, 2020, calls, ad hoc fine-tuning, while they were ostensibly following the rules, how did they reconcile this with their emphasis on transparency? This is where the strategy of obfuscation comes in again, although in a subtler form. The communication strategy adopted during the Great Moderation is better described as selective transparency, since it only ever revealed part of the central bank's goals or strategies. See also Best, 2005. As Friedman, 2002, notes, inflation targeting achieves credibility in the specific sense of making a commitment to low inflation believable, by keeping out of the discussion those considerations that would reveal that commitment to be qualified, and hence not completely credible in the usual sense. It is transparent, in that it holds a part of what the central bank is doing before clear glass while obscuring other parts behind a logical partition. pp. 16-17. Political pushback. The downsides of invisibility. As central bankers became more uncomfortable with acknowledging the limits of their expertise during the Great Moderation, they used a combination of dismissal, displacement and partial obfuscation to manage their discomfort. Because central banks followed the markets and only communicated their actions and goals in the language of inflation targeting, they appeared to be playing a less important role in the economy than before. In the process, their liminal role in the political economy became less visible as they moved into the background as economic technicians rather than sovereign actors. Although this might seem like a blessing, avoiding as it does the danger that Volcker's Fed faced when his depoliticization strategy failed and the political costs of his policies became more visible, this trend towards invisibility had its own political costs. As a broader faith in markets' capacity for self-regulation took hold in many economies around the world, Politicians increasingly treated central banks as relatively unimportant, with the Labour government stripping the Bank of England of its role in coordinating financial regulation in the early 2000s, for example, and members of the banking community lambasting Federal Reserve Vice Chairman Alan Blinder when he suggested that the Fed pursue both aspects of its dual mandate, Friedman, 2002, page 11. At 1. Point Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin argued that the Fed itself had become redundant, a view that, Krippner, 2011, suggests based on interviews with Janet Yellen and others, was widely shared on Wall Street in the 1990s. After 2008, of course, that view didn't last long, as the rapid unraveling of the global monetary system in 2008 revealed simultaneously that central banks were very important and that they had made some serious mistakes during the Great Moderation. As I will discuss below, 
Although some central bankers and policymakers recognized these failures and their consequences, others preferred to treat the 2008 crisis as an exceptional moment rather than the beginning of a new monetary order. Central banks have also sought to reassure anxious markets of their command over the necessary expertise by providing even more certain guidance about the future direction of their policies. Yet, as the detour from normal monetary policy has become ever more protracted, and central banks' own forecasts continue to prove wrong, Darvas and Bruegel, 2018, a growing number of central bankers have begun to acknowledge more publicly the limits of their expertise. Policy responses to uncomfortable knowledge. Today, as in the early Reagan years and during the Great Moderation, one of the most popular responses to the challenges posed by the post crisis world has been one of dismissal. Ben Bernanke, 2010, gave a speech shortly after the crisis, which in many ways mirrored Sprinkle and Friedman's earlier arguments that the crisis did not reveal any failures in economic theory itself, but rather with its implementation or in Benanke's terms with its engineering and management. As Johnson, Arl Bundock and Portnyagin's, 2019, recent analysis of central bankers' public statements since the crisis notes, after a brief flurry of debates about possible changes to the status quo, central bankers have returned to defending their conventional assumptions, doubling down on price stability as their core mandate and inflation targeting as their main tool. Mudge and Vaucher, 2019, point to a similar dynamic around the failed DSGE model at the ECB, in which widespread critique ultimately gave way to attempts to fix its more egregious problems without seeking to replace it. There has nonetheless been some strategic reflexivity about possible limits to existing forms of economic expertise, as well as signs that central bankers are beginning to question the sufficiency of the narrow models that they had relied on for so long. While she was Fed Chair, Janet Yellen, 2012, for example, pointed to the limits of conventional rule-based approaches in a low inflation environment. The Bank of Canada's governor, Stephen Pillow, 2014, was even more explicit in outlining the challenges posed by the post-crisis environment, arguing that it was characterized by a kind of nighty and uncertainty that renders most existing models inadequate. This kind of reflexivity about the limits of expert knowledge has become more widespread in the last few years. Although the ECB's leaders began the crisis with a conventional approach to monetary policy, by 2019, Mario Draghi, 2019, its president at that time, was in a position to note that, theories can have blind spots and forecasts can be proven wrong. A theme taken up again in the ECB's strategy review in 2021, ECB, 2021b. Growing recognition of the seriousness of the climate crisis has also led some central banks to note that the hugely increased uncertainty that confronts us today could well become a more common feature, as the ECB executive board member Benoit Coré, 2018, has argued. Given this combination of dismissal and moderate reflexivity about the problem of policy ignorance, it is perhaps not surprising that the strategic responses that central banks have developed have also been a mixed bag. There is little doubt that we are back in a world in which experimentalism is once again widespread. Just as Volcker felt the need to try a range of different strategies to cope with a highly uncertain and contingent economic context, so too have we seen central banks around the world experimenting with unconventional policies ranging from quantitative easing, to targeted purchases of assets and negative interest rates. Yet this time around, Central bankers have generally represented the limits of conventional models as a temporary phenomenon. Whereas Volcker and the FOMC treated their experiments as provisional, central bankers after the 2008 financial crisis treated their new innovations as exceptional, a framing that is different in its insistence that it will be possible to return to the norm once the crisis has passed. Best, 2018. This exceptionalist strategy has allowed central bankers to suspend rather than ending the displacement strategies that were developed in the Great Moderation, continuing to insist that their mandate is still focused on inflation targeting and price stability, even as they deploy a completely different set of tools to get the job done, Johnson et al., 2019. This exceptionalist move has come under increasing pressure in recent years as the return to the normal had been continuously deferred. Yet even as the ECB, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of Canada all recently reviewed their strategic frameworks in light of the lessons learned from over a decade of post-crisis experience, 
Not one of the institutions considered raising the 2% inflation target. Bank of Canada, 2021. ECB, 2021A. Federal Reserve, 2021. 20. In this crisis ridden context, what has happened to the long standing tendency of central banks to use obfuscation to conceal some of their ignorance? Although central banks continue to identify inflation targeting as their primary tool and credible price stability as their goal, as the past decade's crisis response has pushed central banks to take on new, often more politically fraught roles, it has become increasingly difficult to maintain the fiction of a narrow focus that selective transparency afforded. At the same time, the ubiquity of the norm of transparency has ruled out relying on secrecy as Volcker did. In their attempts to develop an alternative communication strategy, central banks have been moving in two different directions in relaying what they know, and what they don't, to markets and the public. On the one hand, in the immediate aftermath of the 2008 crisis, many central banks began to practice forward guidance, in which they communicated far more detail about their interpretation of market conditions and a longer horizon regarding their commitment to a particular interest rate path. The Federal Reserve, the Bank of England and the European Central Bank have sought to use this communication strategy to reduce the uncertainty that market actors face by identifying the criteria that they will be using for changing their policy. On the other hand, some central bankers have raised concerns about the longer-term feasibility of such attempts to reduce uncertainty through more definitive forms of communication. When he headed up the Bank of Canada, Palo, 2014, ended the policy of forward guidance in 2014 because he believed that it created a false impression of the bank's certainty about where the economy was heading. As Kaczynski and Vardy note in a Bank of Canada discussion paper, Communicating uncertainty leads to tension between the need to uphold the central bank's credibility, its ability to anticipate and influence economic outcomes, and its desire to be open about what it doesn't know. Kaczynski and Vardy, 2017. Yet, when Palo, 2014, first proposed paying more attention to model uncertainty within the Bank of Canada, he met a great deal of internal resistance from staff economists. 21. And when he first announced the bank's decision to stop forward guidance in order to let markets do their job of assessing and coping with uncertainty for themselves, many market actors were unhappy, arguing that this shift had generated more volatility, Palmer and Schnur, 2015. Some recent studies have confirmed that market participants are uncomfortable with evidence of central bankers' uncertainty. One experimental study, for example, has found that market actors lose some of their faith in central banks when they publish data on the uncertainty of their inflation forecasts, Rolls and Peterson, 2021. 22. Although some central banks are thus beginning to experiment with a more reflexive form of transparency, they are facing political pushback as they do so. Political pushback. When invisibility is not an option. Even as central banks are under pressure to communicate clearly and decisively about their future policy direction, the scope of those policies has become increasingly broad and complex. Not only have central banks' balance sheets expanded dramatically, as they have bought up massive quantities of government and corporate bonds to keep interest rates down, but their unconventional policies have had increasingly visible political consequences. For example, banks' asset purchases have pushed up their value, increasing returns for the most affluent who are most heavily invested in the stock market, Fonten et al. 2016. Corporate bond purchases have also disproportionately supported investments in carbon intensive industries, intensifying the climate crisis. Van, T. Kluster and Fonten, 2020. As many central banks have also come to play a larger role in macroprudential regulation and financial stability, they are a long way from the narrow role that was once prescribed for them. Coombs, 2022. Thiemann, 2022. By expanding their mandate central banks are multiplying the domains in which they need expert knowledge, raising questions about the sufficiency of their existing tools and models and generating a new round political pushback. Faced with this new round of debates about their role, the ECB, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of Canada have all sought to regain the initiative by undertaking their own strategic reviews of their policies and instruments. Bank of Canada, 2021. ECB, 2021A. Federal Reserve, 2021. 23. All three of these reviews demonstrate a degree of strategic reflexivity, 
as they are all framed in part as attempts to come to terms with and address the limits of existing models in the face of a changing economic environment. At the same time, in spite of their important differences, it is striking that all three revised strategies rely on ambiguous wording in order to create extra flexibility in their operations. The Federal Reserve has decided to adopt average inflation targeting, allowing the FOMC to pursue inflation levels higher or lower than the 2% target to make up for historical deviations. Yet its new policy statement has been widely criticized for its vagueness, since the document doesn't spell out how quickly the Fed would attempt to return to the norm nor how far they would go to make up for past deviations, Gilly et al., 2020. The Bank of Canada chose to maintain its 2% inflation target but added an explicit reference to employment for the first time in order to allow the bank to take it into account when setting interest rates, chiefly through the use of the flexibility of its framework, Bank of Canada, 2021. The ECB opted to increase its flexibility by defining the medium term, the time frame over which the inflation target should be reached, ambiguously enough to allow the bank to take other variables into account as needed, such as employment and financial stability, ECB, 2021A. These three examples suggest that central banks continue to find a measure of obfuscation useful for navigating the limits of monetary expertise, particularly in difficult times. As I have argued elsewhere, BEST, 2005, financial institutions have often relied on ambiguity in order to grant themselves a measure of flexibility. For central banks, ambiguous policy mandates also provide one solution to the dilemma of too much political visibility, providing them some cover from prying eyes. Volcker's secrecy may not be a politically viable strategy any longer, but his combination of strategic reflexivity, experimentation and a little mystification does live on in another form. Conclusion. Because their authority and autonomy depend on their demonstration of expertise, central banks must develop a range of strategies for coping with the uncomfortable fact of their ignorance. These strategies have shifted over time, combining dismissal, displacement, exceptionalism, obfuscation and reflexivity in new forms and combinations. Yet those strategies remain politically fraught, as they face what I have called the dilemma of expert visibility. Central banks' expertise must be visible enough to demonstrate mastery, but not so visible that they give away too much of the game and reveal the often ad hoc nature of their strategies and the political consequences of their actions. In the last couple of years, in the context of the COVID pandemic and the growing recognition of the magnitude of the climate crisis, there are signs that we are seeing a broader shift in the attitudes to the uncomfortable problem of policy ignorance and the strategies needed to address it as central banks have grown more reflexive about the limits of their expertise. It is too soon, however, to conclude that we are moving towards a time when central banks will no longer be uncomfortable about their ignorance. As the recent debates around central banks' expanded role makes clear, the political costs of revealing the ad hoc and politically charged nature of monetary policy can be very high indeed. And yet, if we have learned anything from the great moderation and its eventual collapse, it is that its particularly aggressive attempt to dismiss and displace all evidence of the messy uncertainties of actually lived economic experience was unsustainable both economically and politically. As Rayner, 2012, argues in the paper that was the inspiration for this project, and as economic policymakers may be finally coming to recognize, it is only by acknowledging the existence of uncomfortable knowledge, accepting the intractability of some problems and recognizing the clumsiness of any potential solution, that we will develop the policy strategies that we need to cope with the world we live in today. Acknowledgements. Earlier versions of this paper were presented at a session of the Council for European Studies Conference in 2021, and to two online working groups on central banking, one hosted by Matthias Thiemann and Nathan Coombs, the other hosted by Leah Downey, Stefan Eich and Mark Blith. Both of these groups provided invaluable insights and inspiration into my thinking on central banking and the politics of expertise and kept me engaged with this research during the many difficult months of pandemic isolation. The author would particularly like to thank the hosts of these working groups together with Manuela Moschella, Ben Clift, Deborah Mabbitt, Michael Orsini, Peter Dietsch, Honor Osgood, Edin Ibrachevich. Leon Wanslobin and Dan Rowe for their very helpful comments on earlier versions. The author would also like to acknowledge the excellent research assistance of Quinn Barry Watts, 
and the invaluable help of the archivists at the Library of Congress Manuscript Reading Room and the U.S. National Archives at College Park.